So we wrote down the consequences of being exact. That was the exact check right there. And now we're going to suppose H depends only on Y. So which derivative will be zero? X. So that means our HX will equal zero. So that's what it means. If H depends only on Y, then the X derivative will be zero. Because it has no dependence on X. That would be ddx of h will be 0. So that's the consequence of h depending only on y. Now we're supposing this. So this is basically if h is going to be only dependent on y. So let's look at the consequences here. So I'm going to rewrite the line up there, except our hx is 0 this time. So we have hyp plus h py equals hx. Oops, hx is gone. So we just have hqx. So that hxq disappeared. Now I'm going to write this in the derivative form. So we got dh dy p p plus h times d d dy of p equals h d dx of q. And now we're going to solve for dh dy, which is pretty easy to do. So we're going to solve for dh dy. So I'm going to subtract the uh, other term out and then divide by p. So that's all we're going to do here. So I'm going to subtract that this term to the other side and then divide by p. back in the short notation. I don't know why. I temporarily use the uh, D notation instead of the sub script, but that's all right. And last step, divide by P. What algebra can I do on the right side? Factor out that h. So let's get the h out of there. We're basically going to have a separable differential equation here, is what's going to happen. <coughs> so that h times qx minus px over p equals dh over dy. So divide the h over, so we got 1 over h dh. I'm going to multiply the dy to the other side. How do we solve for h? Integrate. Integrate. So basically we got a separable right here, so we'll just be integrating. So we get LNH equals, now I don't know QX, PY, and P, so I'm just going to leave it as this with a. Isn't that a PX? Oh. Uh oh. Should be a PY. Something went wrong. I just wrote something down wrong. So we have the X derivative of Q. There we go. Should be a PY on that line. And last, we just take 
and ln inverse of both sides, so we get h is e to this integral. So this is one way, uh, this is how we can get h if it depends only on y. So this is h if it depends on y. So there will be a plus c, but I bring the plus c in at the end of the last antiderivative. So the way I say it is basically what I just circled, the plus c's hiding in that, basically. So that's, so that's h only if h depends on y. Yes, that's h if h only depends on y. What's that? Yeah. It is what it is. When H depends only on Y. <coughs> so now we're going to suppose H depends only on X and pretty much do the same steps, but the other one will be zero. H depends only on x. So what derivative h will be 0? y. So that means our h y is 0. So I'll rewrite that. Um, let's see. I'll rewrite this relationship right there. That was our exact consequence. I shall rewrite it. and also without the hy in it. So we got hpy equals dh over dxq. Is that an No. That's an h. So it should be the equation that was above, but we, the hy term disappeared. So we want to figure out what h is. So we're basically solving for dx over dh. And doing the exact same process as before. So we got HPY minus HQX divided by Q equals DH DX. So I'll factor H out and divide by H at the same time. So we got one over H DH, multiply DX to the other side. I'm skipping more steps this time around because it's pretty much the same steps we did, just slightly different. And integrate, so we get LNH equals this integral. Uh oh. Oh, should be over Q. There we go. Last, we're going to ln inverse, so h is going to be e to this integral. And this is when h depends only on x. At the very end, I'm going to give you some rules to determine what H is going to depend on. It'll look kind of like our exact test, except that it'll be a little bit different. Thanks. So now we're going to suppose H depends on the product XY. So we're going to suppose So this is not x comma y, this is the product x, y. So we're going to let u equal x, y.
And when we're going to make a substitution, we're going to also have to figure out what is du and how does that relate to dx and dy. So this should be a really easy derivative to take. So we're going to apply d to this. So figure out your relationship of the derivatives of the variables. Hey, going back to the last, last yeah. box equation, factor out the h's. Yeah, oh, geez. Let's see. So they should disappear at this step. So we got py minus qx. Good catch. So we have this, uh, <coughs> and of course h is now h of u, so we need to compute hx. How in the world do we take the x derivative of h of u? What rule do I need to use? Chain rule. So it's going to be h prime of u uh, times, now it's probably not a good idea to write h prime. What should I, what notation should I use instead? Uh, I should use subscript because I'm taking an x derivative. So we're at hx of u uh, times ux. So that's the chain rule written out with subscript notation. Um, and if you want me to write it in the regular notation, your base it's basically h prime of u times u prime. It's all we're writing, but the problem is you can't just write prime because there's two variables that it can depend on. So that would be ambiguous notation. And hy is the exact same thing. Just hy of u times uy. So I'm going to write down that exact relationship, which was, you know, I, I'm using it so much, I'm going to put an asterisk next to it, so when I refer to it, I'll just put a little asterisk in here. So this was super useful, so I'm going to put an asterisk like this, so when I refer to it, I'll just refer to asterisk. So all we're going to do is replace hy and hx by the two that we just computed. So that's all we're going to do right here. So here's a perfect time to use parentheses, except there'll be a whole lot of parentheses all over the place. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm basically intentionally leaving spaces right here. So that I know, uh, <coughs> if I write like this, it's not clear that that y is a derivative. So I'm kind of spacing things out carefully and using subscripts carefully. So I'm trying to make sure that my subscript really looks like a subscript and I'm spacing out the products a little bit. So HPY, that doesn't change. HPY equals HX is now HX of U, UX times Q plus HQX. So 
So I'm going to collect the h prime terms or the derivative terms together. Oh, I actually just totally lied a minute ago. Let's go back to these two computations for a minute. The way it's written, h doesn't depend on x, it depends on x, y, x times y. So I took a u, no, I took an x derivative, yeah. So I can write this as just h prime. u does, u depends on x and y, so I can't do that with u. do the same thing here. So collecting my h prime terms together. So we got h prime u u y p minus h prime u u x q equals hqx minus hpy. What can I factor on the right side? H. So I can factor an h on the right side, so that's familiar. That's pretty much how the other two went. What about the left side? What can I factor? h prime. So we're going to have h prime of u uh, times uyp minus uxq. Oh, we can compute uy and ux. Those are super easy. So we're going to go do that right now. So u equals xy. ux is ddx of u, which is ddx of xy. And what is the x derivative of xy? That's just y and then ui. I'll skip all the steps. Ui is going to equal x. So we just did those two computations right there. So they're super easy. So ux is y and ui is x. I'll try to remember that. Ui is x times p minus y times q. Now this is super not commutative. What I mean by that What do I mean on the left side when I write xp? Yeah. x times p. What do I mean on the right side? So something completely different. The right side is a derivative with respect to x. The left side is uh, multiplication with no derivative. So this, they very much don't commute. They're completely different operations. So that's true for xp and for qy. So you change the order. It's completely different. So now, let's see, I think we did all the easy stuff. That's the easy stuff. Oh yeah, it's definitely the easy stuff. So let's collect all the h's together. So I'm going to divide both sides by h. So we got h prime u times 1 over h. I'll write it as h of u now. Equals, I'm going to divide that uh, xp minus yq. So we've got qx minus py divided by xp minus yq. Now this right side, so 
the assumption we made on the left is that this function h depends on x, y. And it's equal to the right side, which means the right side has to depend on x, y also. Only because they're equal. Not because the right side looks any particular way. Because I know the left side depends on x, y, and it's equal to the right side, so the right side has that same property. So the right side depends on x, y. And of course, x, y, we called u. So the right side is actually a function of u. Oh, the left side is a function of u. So well, I could take a u antiderivative. And that is what we're going to do. So let's write h prime as dh over du times 1 over h of u equals same stuff on the right, qx minus py over xp minus yq and multiply du to the other side. So we got 1 over h dh equals qx minus py divided by xp minus yq du. So we're ready for an antiderivative. So we'll take that antiderivative now. It's actually a separable differential equation in h and u at this point. So I have ln of h equals uh, this integral. And I'll take ln inverse of both sides. So regular h equals e to this integral qx minus py over xp minus yq du. So I mentioned that, that this weird quotient that I just drew an arrow to is supposed to be a function of u. So if you get the x derivative q, the y derivative p, divided by this denominator, if that's a function of x, y, then uh, you can go this route. So that's how you're going to detect it. So if this simplifies to a function of x, y, which is u, then you can go this route. Then h of u is this, what we just wrote down. Oh, so if you're a function of u, then uh, we're going to let capital F of u equal qx minus py over xp minus yq. They use a capital F of U in the book too, right? Oh no. So I definitely chuckle whenever I take U and F it, um, or have a function F of U, but I'm pretty sure in the book they actually use these letters. Yep. So I'm not being silly, somebody else is. Okay, so those are our three cases. Let's summarize, and then we're going to do two problems. Let's see. We went with y only was our first case. So I'll summarize them in that order. So here's case one. Let capital F equal... y minus qx over negative p, hold on, negative p, py minus qx over negative p, so that we got, oh yeah, <coughs> so we're on this one right here, I just changed the order, basically, and then made it negative, so that's what's going on. So it's this exact one, we're just changing the order and making it negative. So there's no funny business going on here. Uh, 
yeah, you'll see why when I run run all three cases out, it'll be more more clear. So this will be f, uh, and this is a function of y only. So and f is a function of y. So case two, we're going to let f equal py minus qx over q. And this function f is, and f is a function of x only. And in case three, f will be py minus qx divided by yq minus xp is a function of and f is a function of xy which equals u. So it should be more clear why we did py minus qx. You basically compute that once and then you divide it by you attempt to divide it by three different things. And hopefully one of them will be either a function of y, a function of x, or a function of x times y, depending on which of the three. So this really needs to be in your uh, cheat sheet. And then regardless of which one you use, the integrating factor, which you may have forgotten about, so I'll review that in a minute. The integrating factor, they use rho for this, rho equals e to the integral of capital F. Where integral of capital F is D blank, where blank is either X, Y, or U. So whatever of the variables the variable you put is either x, y, or u, depending on if you are in case, uh oh, I should have gone y, x, or u. And I think I can write respectively. So if you're a case one, you're gonna do a dy antiderivative. If you're a case two, you depend on x is dx antiderivative. If you're in case three, you're gonna do a du antiderivative. So it just goes in the same order as these cases up here. So this is basically what you need on your cheat sheet, right here. You can condense it down a little bit, but you really need this. All right, so I will do the first example, and then you will do the second example. And we're only doing two problems here. Oh, wait, let's review integrating factors, wow. So I'm gonna go way back to the beginning for a minute. <coughs> So what we did was suppose that there was this special magic H function that made our uh, ODE, our original ODE exact. So when we multiply it by this, uh, I called it row at the end, when we multiply by this row, we should have an exact ODE. And you find the two, you basically union the two antiderivatives together, is how we're going to solve it. So this goes back to exact, which was, I think, two classes ago. Exact is probably the easiest one to solve aside from separable. So, good news is we're not going back to linear. That would be miserable. Go to linear and then that turned into homogeneous, that turned into separable, that would have been horrible. So we're going right to exact and then that's pretty easily solvable. All right, first example. First function of y cubed plus xy squared plus y dx, definitely not linear, you can tell right away, plus x cubed plus x squared plus y plus x dy equals zero. So no matter which case we have, you're going to start by finding py minus qx. So do that right now. So no matter what we're doing, you got PY minus QX. And remember, P is your first 
coefficient function and q is your second coefficient function. Yes, mind your p's and q's and their derivatives. Questions on the py minus qx. It should have been pretty straightforward computation there. So you got 3y squared minus 3x squared. So what we need to do now is divide it by different things and hope that one of those three works out to just a function of x, just a function of y, or a function of x times y. So we'll just go 1, 2, 3. So let's divide by negative p and see what we get. Probably a good idea to write case one because otherwise if you don't start labeling things you'll just have stuff written all over your paper you want to make sure things are organized so the only thing I can really do that's kind of obvious is factor out a y out of p, but that's still not going to get us a function of x or y or x times y. So I don't think this is going to work. So let's put a big x there, so that's not going to work. We're going to try case 2, which is similar, but you're going to divide by q. So we get py minus qx over q. If you notice, the q function is pretty similar to the p function. It's going to have the same problem. So this is not going to work either. So the only chance we really have is case 3. Now if you're doing these on your own, I would not so quickly dismiss a case. If you're working on a quiz, I would spend another 30 seconds and actually write it down and make sure that it's not going to turn into that form. We got py minus qx over yq minus xp. And make sure you do y times q, not y times p. xy canceling the negative xy, x squared y squared canceling x squared negative x squared y squared, and we're left with 3y squared minus 3x squared divided by yx cubed minus xy cubed. What can I factor out? Yes. Factor out x, and I can also factor out a y. And I'm left with x squared minus y squared. What can I factor out of the numerator? 3. 
So that's super similar factors there. X squared minus Y squared and Y squared minus X squared. How do I turn one factor into the other? So basically they're negatives of each other. So if you're feeling very clever, you can cancel them out to negative one. If not, what I'm gonna do is multiply by one. So I'm multiplying by negative one squared. So I'm really just distributing one of the negative ones inside here. So we got X squared minus Y squared. So any questions on that algebra? Positive one's the only number allowed to multiply by and not change your equation. So we got canceling factors, negative three over x, y. Oh, look at that. Is this a function of x times y? Yep. So this is supposed to be f of u. So this is negative three over u. So that's f of u. So any questions on getting there? So the, if it would have been like case one, you would just be a lot. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't be worth oh, making a substitution. Be yeah, I wouldn't make a substitution at that point. You can, but that's not going to do much. Uh, so that's f of u. So <coughs> this is what we're doing next. Our row is e to the antiderivative of that f of u function. And this function will be a super easy antiderivative. Yeah. Not sure. I think your book uses H when they like do the proof, but then row when they write the summary at the end is kind of strange. But yeah, basically P is Yeah, P is H. Or row is H. So we got E to the integral negative three over U DU. So that is E to the negative three antiderivative one over U DU, and that's just ln of U plus C. Don't forget your plus, do we need a plus C? I actually don't think we use the plus C here. Yeah, we don't need our plus C on this step, I'm pretty sure. So we have negative three ln U, which we can rewrite as E to the ln ln u to the negative three power, which is u to the negative three. All right, so we've got our integrating factor. Now we multiply our original function by u to the negative three, which is the same as one over u cubed, which is one over x y cubed, or one over x cube y cubed. So that's what we'll be. We'll multiply by that version. So we got y cubed plus x y squared plus y dx plus x cubed plus x squared y plus x dy equals zero. And we're multiplying by one over x cubed y cubed.
All right. The algebra felt like the hardest thing I did in class so far. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> All right, so any questions on that multiplication right there? What type of a differential equation should we be looking at? Exact. How in the world do we handle exact equations? We first check to make sure which is, let's see, I don't want to use P, and, well, actually, I didn't really use P and Q. No, I totally did use P and Q. So this is like a modified PQ right here. I guess technically it would be rho, rho P, which looks strange. <laughs> and that would be rho Q. Oh, that, you the red rho this whole yeah, well, this, that's rho right there. Oh, but we haven't actually rho that I've been writing this P. Well, if you write P, P is already in use in the... P is like a reserved letter because we always use it for the first coefficient function, basically. So that's why we're not using lowercase p as our that's integrating factor. Well. You can just round off your, you know, other P, basically, so it looks like a row. All right, so what... These aren't quite equal. What do we have to check to make sure on exact? So here's our exact check. So I don't know. They better be, or else we're in some serious trouble. So take the y derivative on the left and the x derivative on the right, and hopefully they'll be equal. Questions on that y derivative of the left? So now we're going for the x derivative of rho q, x derivative of the right coefficient function. your check and you don't find that it, it's exact, you either didn't have uh, the case you thought you had, so whatever, I think we have case three, I either didn't have case three or I made some mistake on my exact check. So it's really important that you check that it's actually exact before you go about solving it like it is exact. All right, so we just passed the exact check, so I'll just box that up. So we just pass that. What do we do to solve exact O to E? Yep, you take the antiderivative of the original P, well, I should say antiderivative of rho P and antiderivative of rho Q. 
because the exact was the row times those. It wasn't just the P and the Q. It was row P and row Q that made it exact. So we're going to do integral row P dx and integral row Q dy. So take the x and the y antiderivatives of these. And I recommend you use these forms that we just wrote out. Uh, I'm circling now. Those are probably the best forms for doing anti. Oh no, that one, that form right there. Just use the. You're gonna use anti-power rule. Is what you should be using here. derivative questions. So now we're just going to collect. We don't want to duplicate anything, so I'm going to circle things that appear twice. What was the rule I told you of things that should appear twice? I know you remember back to, I think, two or three classes ago. So we do want to write them once, but if they appear twice, they'll be a function of x and y together. If it's only x or only y, it'll appear only in one of the two antiderivatives. So right here, this is a nice place to check. So anything that depends on x and y should appear in both, both of these. And then the things that don't only depend on x or y, which is exactly what's happening here. So we're going to union these. And let's write it a little bit nicer. We get negative one half x, uh, negative one over two x squared. Minus one over x y. Minus two over x squared y squared. And then minus 1 over 2y squared. And it should be equal to a constant. If you don't like fractions, you can multiply by x squared y squared, and then you won't have a fraction anymore. But the only downside is you'll have a constant times x squared y squared. You're going to multiply it by x squared, y squared. Oh no. 
So that two should be in the denominator. Is that what you were saying? Your unit, yes, yeah, so you don't want to, you be double counting then. Yeah, so you're not, that's why I put union in quotes. You're kind of, you're summing up all the terms, but not duplicating any terms. So your book has a more detailed explanation of it, but you're basically taking unique terms and adding them together. And that's all you're doing. So you are adding them together. Yep. The unique terms are weak. Yep, you're summing the unique terms. So you don't want to include duplicates, basically. So what I'm doing is I'm circling duplicates so that I only bring yeah I'm only bringing like let's say the first two down I'm not I'm not bringing these two in because if I brought all them in I would have I would get two times what I want for those functions. So I come for the x to negative two over negative two. You got one over two x squared. Well, I just rewrote it with positive powers. No, the negative two should be on the bottom. Or the two should be on the bottom. The negative can be wherever it wants to be. Okay. <laughs> now let me erase. Oh well. Yeah, so just double don't double count things. The best thing to do is just practice. And if hopefully there should be a good mix of uh, these factor types in your homeworks. Um, but this won't be on your quiz tomorrow. This